Welcome. We're going to get started here. Call to order of the Hollis School Board, Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. At this point, I think I'm going to dispense with the normal preamble and get right into the agenda here. So why don't we call for agenda adjustments? We don't have any, but I do want to just note that we do need a non-public tonight. Non-public. Any agenda adjustments from the membership? Seeing none. Moving to correspondence, resignations, and nominations. A couple things for the board. First of all, Tiffany Tester has just joined us. When we get down to the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, she'll provide the update. Tiffany is co-facilitating for us, and we'll have various presenters coming at different times to the board. Also, I have a retirement. Nancy Kring Burns has offered her retirement effective the end of October, so I'd like to put that in front of the board for approval. Okay. So are we going to be doing that now in this part of the agenda? We can do that now. So I'll take a motion for that, please. Motion to approve the retirement. Second. Discussion? She'll be missed. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. With our compliments and congratulations. Okay. Seeing no other discussions or comments, all in favor? Thank you for her years of service. Yeah, she's done a tremendous job. Absolutely. Just informational, Brittany Ducharme will be taking a leave of absence in January to May to welcome her first child. So that's just so when the board sees the posting, you'll be aware of that, but it's all covered under the CBA, so there's no motion needed there. And then just want to make the board aware, we have a few staff who are out with the family leave piece regarding their children, so we'll be hearing back from them as far as their ability to maybe return to work or they may select to do a leave. It'll be something that I would have to bring to you at the December meeting because it's scheduled to happen this month, but each of these positions already has somebody in the classroom or for them, so it's not like we would have a vacancy. It would just be a matter of informing the board of what individual teachers may need to take more time because of their children or maybe return. So we'll do that at the December meeting. And that's it for correspondence, resignations, and nominations. All right. Let's move on to approval of the minutes of September 2020. I got that. I'd like to move to approve the Hollis School Board minutes from September 30th, 2020 with the following amendments offered. Page 1, line 24, replace spoke of with stated. Page 3, line 28, school should be plural. Page 4, line 27, replace American with America. Page 5, line 28, replace many with may. Page 12, line 36, delete the word provided. Page 15, line 10, insert she responded before she would do. Page 17, line 20, replace facility with faculty. Second. 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 Okay. Any discussion or additional amendments? Seeing none, call the vote. All in favor? 4-0-0. Any other? Do we have any other minutes? I only see the one. There were not. Do I move to approve the non-public minutes? Yeah, non-public needs to be approved as well. Yes. Okay. So I move to approve the Hollis School Board non-public minutes from September 30th, 2020. Second. Any other changes or concerns around that? Seeing none, all in favor? 4-0-0. Okay. I guess we can move into the public hearing. And this is to gather input on the receipt of the expenditure of fiscal year 2021, unanticipated revenue associated with the CARES Act and other local, state, and federal resources as forth in RSA 198-20-B. 
what I'll ask is Gina will give you kind of a, a background update and that will bring us up to the start of the public hearing and at that point I'd have Rob call the public hearing because it's posted for 6.15 and we're a couple minutes early. Okay. But this way we can give you all the background, answer any questions you may have, then open the public hearing, see if we get any public input on that piece and then move forward from there. Okay. Okay, so similar to um, our typical annual meeting where we have um, an article that allows us to accept um, special ed uh, funding, mm -hmm. um, we have received some unanticipated funding uh, for, through CARES Act. So we had the remote learning grant, we had um, CARES Act funding a couple weeks ago. They just announced that we would be receiving an additional $200 per student. And for Hollis, that would be $124,200 of unanticipated revenue um, that would be arriving next week. Um, and then it's, it's written in a vague manner because there are other pot potential local, state, or federal resources that might um, come our way or become available to us, such as FEMA money that we might be um, asking th the town to share their portion of, but we can't utilize the funding without permission to do so. So that's what we are asking for. We're asking for permission to utilize the funding um, for the intended purposes of, um, of the funding. Mm -hmm. So that will certainly help um, specifically the, the CARES Act and this flat $200 per student specifically can help us with um, legal fees around um, returning to school, um, additional personnel, PPE, um, you name it, anything that's related to COVID, things that we had to put in place between March and December 30th um, would be toward this grant. It's not something that we have to apply for. It's, an, it's a straight allocation based on our um, number of students. So this is significantly higher than what we would typically get based on our, um, um, you know, our free and reduced status and things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, we would be uh, um, in favor of accepting the money. Sure, sure. Any co questions or comments regarding that? I'll just add that there's an additional $10 million of potential funding if we exceed the $124,200, and that would be um, on an application basis, also must be fully executed and um, paid for by December 30th, um, but that is also available if we demonstrate that we have a need greater than this. So we would like to have this public hearing to be able to accept any funding that might come our way between now and the end of the fiscal year. Is there any kind of grant submittal process to go into the, to get so access for, those additional funds? For CARES Act, yes, I had to submit a grant. For the remote learning grant, yes, we had to submit a grant. Yeah. Um, for this, it's a flat funding. However, for five years after this, we have to be able to on the ready demonstrate um, exactly what we used the money for, how we used it, and then the, all the supporting documents. So we don't have to apply for it ahead of time. They're going to make sure we used it appropriately. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I have 609. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I can do with the board's permission is I can do the principal's report. Okay, let's do and that. I just wanted to highlight a couple things. First of all, I want to again publicly thank uh, Paula, Candy, Ann, and Nicole for all their efforts. Um, Fortunately, we have been in, in very good shape recently with COVID, but to their credit, uh, when we encountered some difficulties a few weeks ago, by the next morning, we had our students up and running on remote learning, uh, the teacher and all that, and that was um, spearheaded through Nicole Tomaselli, who does just a wonderful job. Uh, Paula and Candy would work with Gina, Bob, and I to get all the information out, to do all the contact tracing and all those elements. So we're, we're really, uh, pleased with our response. Uh, we want to publicly thank our teachers who are just doing the yeoman's work every day. Um, I'm hearing very positive things for both in the classroom, which I get to see, but online as well. And we recently reached um, an agreement through the professional growth model, which is our uh, how we observe teachers. Mm -hmm. And we are beginning the process of observing both teachers in person and online. So that will be exciting. Uh, and to see some of the different things that have taken place. The uh, recent Professional Development Day focused on social emotional learning because we're still dealing with a lot of students who were somewhat traumatized for their months away from school. 
as well as ways to promote uh, more robust online resources and different things. And those were led by our own teachers and Brookline and Hollis work collaboratively as which result in us putting on many, many more workshops than we could do as separate. And those are very, very well received and would like to thank everybody for their, their work just this week. Um, the both schools are working on virtual programs to celebrate Veterans Day next week. Uh, it's something that is so important to our kids and to recognize those members of the communities that served and we're really excited about uh, the, the plans that they are putting forward. We also uh, received our enrollment projections from NESDEC, which is the service we use to provide that. And I'll provide you copies for Hollis before you leave tonight. Uh, it's already been sent to the, the budget committee. And again, the, the, the projections look about the same with us growing over the next few years. This is a very difficult year because we do have a larger homeschool population uh, as a result of the pandemic and there are just different things going on. But we are also encountering a number of people who are in the process of building homes in our community or moving into homes. So it's, it's very robust. Uh, I'd also like to report that uh, both Hollis Primary and Hollis Upper Elementary uh, have had their lights replaced. Uh, we ha only have 16 fixtures remaining to do and those are just back ordered. Uh, but as you can notice from the ones here, it's a much sleeker system. It will save us approximately 15% in our energy bills from the lights. And they are all uh, programmed and will be put on timers so that they'll have automatic shutoffs if the room is not occupied. But it's not like the old days where we could be sitting here in the whole back of the hall would go. Uh, it's just a different <laughs> level of programming now, so it works out very well. Um, and both principals wanted me to share that they continue to do their various awards recognizing students' performance and all the good works that's going on in their building, whether it be through an adult or through uh, the students. So Candy continues with her wing awards and those get publicized. And then Paula has had the majority of her remote students um, participate during her morning announcements, which has been great. And then we had our first period where parents could return we had approximately 12 requests to return. Ultimately, uh, about seven families took advantage of that opportunity to come back to school full time. We didn't have anybody go from in-person to remote. The next uh, potential change is November 30th, and the principals will get that word out to families mm -hmm. and let them know for anybody who might be interested in making a switch either way. And I'll take any questions about the principal's reports that you may so have. So that's mostly inbound changes, right? right. Um, no, no outbound. Uh, there, there were, remote. I think in the last month we had one outbound, and that was because of a family's change of schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and it revolved around work, and it just made it easier for the family. So we've had one outbound over the last 30 days, and I think it was seven come in. How? How much of a challenge was that with the social distancing and the new requirements we have to meet um, to accommodate? For the, for the most part, all of them happened to be coming into grades that had openings. And we oh. still have room at sixth grade. Um, in uh, one case, and it wasn't in the Hollis district, it was in one of our other districts, what we did to accommodate the request is because they were siblings, they sat a little closer together, but they're living together all the time. Yeah. So that was acceptable to the parents. So we are getting creative uh, because again, as time goes on, you know, more families are being called back to be in person at work and things of that nature. So uh, we do expect as long as the numbers keep trending, uh, well, hopefully the numbers will start to trend again in a positive direction because recently they're trending a, a little differently. They, they, than we would like, but at the same time, we, we pay a lot of attention to the positivity rate, and that seems to be hovering around the same place. Um, just because I got asked the other day, uh, across the SAU, we've had seven total cases. Uh, one of those was a remote student, six were associated in some with our schools. Uh, we have had some students have to quarantine, and their families have been tremendous, and that has gone extremely well. Uh, we are wrapping up the fall athletic season this week 
and we're excited about that and the high school and middle school are working on their plans for the winter and we continue to look at different things that we can do whether it's in person or remotely to offer opportunities for our students k-6 to <coughs> Andy, at our last meeting we talked a lot about um, travel people traveling over the holidays is there anything new to report or to discuss on that account we uh, actually sat Bob sat through the um, DHHS uh, talk today there's been no change they hope to come out with something in a few days it does look like there's potential to see some even reduced travel in New England because the way numbers are trending mm -hmm. so we may see some different things coming out uh, each of our people is put in a newsletter if you are traveling let us know we'll work with you uh, we have a couple families that um, will be forced to travel for circumstances that they cannot control uh, so we'll be making those accommodations for the student to um, go into remote return and stay into remote but we have said to families because it'll also be during that transition period where more families could come back you risk the potential that you may have to stay remote until the next uh, open enrollment period for lack of a better term how is so, that so they, they'd be giving up their spot potentially yes Mm -hmm. for more extensive travel right because it there some families are going they tend to extend the vacation whether it's a pandemic or not and as a result of that when you look at where they'd extend to and where the quarantine would go to it just makes sense for them to wait to the next open enrollment now I think it'd be high probability they'll they'll be able to come back but I just think it's easier to be fair and upfront with all the families that it's not a guarantee do we already and the family's been wonderful do we already have that next date set then the well the, the next one is the November yep. 30th yep. Uh, and then we're discussing the next one because we're going to talk a little bit about the calendar later on and just kind of get some of your thoughts and then in December we'll come back with what we would call some uh, recommendations for you to consider um, but really what we've been trying to do is look at it in what I'll call uh, two-week windows mm -hmm. and a lot has worked out well like next week we have Veterans Day so that breaks it down and then went to Thanksgiving, you come back and it's two weeks and then you're to Christmas. Mm -hmm. But then we go into some long stretches. And we also know historically that our largest uh, time of sickness, stomach aches, all of those things that we traditionally see is that uh, before February vacation, we usually limp into February vacation. <laughs> and then March is a very long month. So we're gonna try to break that up. But we'll talk about that a little more when we go into the calendar in a couple of minutes. Um, just a clarification on the seven documented cases in the district. Uh, my understanding, none of those were um, in school transmission, or would that not be something that made, would be made public? No, they, they were, from everything we know, working with DHHS, they were all uh, came to the buildings and we had no transmission from classroom to classroom or child to child. Yeah, I think that's great. To, that's great. Yeah, to yeah I mean, the, the, I, I can't stress enough how fabulous the kids have been. I mean, the masks and, and the listening and, and paying attention to the rules, because a lot of times we hear the, the negatives about children. Uh, but I think they totally understand from our youngest to our sixth graders that this is important and they're really doing a great job. And I think a lot of credit has to also go to the parent. Because I think one of the reasons we're successful is because it's not ending at three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. You know, our families are doing the best they can, essential traveling, if they're doing that, if they're following all the guidelines of those activities so I you know I see that as a, a byproduct of why we're successful because we're working together as a community you know I said this privately to Andy just in a personal conversation but something that I'm really marveling at my my kids are full of remote at HPS and it's the only time I think that a parent has the opportunity to bear direct witness to their child's education. And it's really fun to hear what's going on and hear the way that they're being spoken to by their teachers, which is extraordinary. You know, you, they'd come home from school and say, how was school? It was great. What'd you do? I had pizza for lunch. <laughs> you don't get to hear about some of that. And so to be able to talk about the curriculum with especially the social emotional learning and then to see it actually being put into uh, play essentially with the kids and the practice that they do and you know self-affirmations and things 
it's it's really really cool to just be able mm. to see that. Mm. So from a remote parent's perspective, this is unique and tremendous. Thank you. Uh, just a couple other things about our protocols. Um, with regard to our ventilation, we will have that retested over Thanksgiving during that week. Lance, uh, our facilities director, will be taking care of that. Uh, we are still circulating three hours before school starts. The air goes on and stays on for three hours after. So we completely get an airflow. Obviously, we'll be using less windows and doors coming up. But from uh, my conversation with our HVAC consultant, um, the system is 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 designed for that to happen, and actually windows and doors can kind of in some ways hinder that airflow. Uh, it's beyond my skill set, but he's assured me that 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 is the case, and we've communicated that with our teachers, and we'll be doing a Zoom before we leave for the Thanksgiving holiday that will kind of talk to them about that so they have a better understanding of that as well. And I have uh, one of our facilities question. We obviously put tents outside yep. the schools for the outdoor learning. How long are they slated to be out there and be used? They will be taken down at Thanksgiving week. Okay. And then we have tentatively scheduled them for like the end of March, April, depending on where the data is and what's going on to be reinstalled. Great, thank you. I guess piggybacking on that, um, is there plans to continue continue more time outdoors or um, is or, or does that mean that we're kind of going back to standard um, practices with how much time the kids are spending outside I think it's weather or permit. maybe you don't know the answer to that it, I mean, maybe no, that's more building today, actually at leadership yeah. I mean it does as weather permits are we going to be sitting on um, our beach towels just reading outside probably not yeah but certainly just as we do with recess you know last year um, we're outside as long as it's above whatever the number is, 25 degrees. So we'll, we'll still take a stroll. It might be a faster stroll <laughs> mm -hmm. to get some fresh air and um, to get an appropriate mask break. But yeah. Okay. So more than last year, but we're just not leisurely hanging out outside. Right. Probably. Okay. And, Good. and the principals are actually working on uh, what's going to be the best way to store all that material. Because again, uh, it's we're just in different environments so 20 pairs of boots are going to have to go in the hallway but at the same time you have to have six feet of clearance in the hallway for safety issues for the fire department so there's a lot of things that go into this it's not just uh, you know, bring your your hats and your mittens it's a, it's a complex thing so um, as Gina said we had leadership today and the principals are all working on that and even at the middle school and high school which traditionally don't go out that much, they're going to be out much more than they have been in any other year. Yeah, good. Great, thank you. Okay, any, any other questions or comments on the principles of reports? Okay, I'd like to get back into our public hearing. Do we need to yep. recess? Mm -hmm. I think it, how's the wording? Yeah, it should be. Motion to adjourn uh, a school board meeting. Well, it's not, it wouldn't be adjourned. It would oh, be to recess. recess. Yes, recess. Yeah. Oh my God, I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> At 624. You don't want to do that. So we, you have a second? Second. Yeah. Okay. Um, any discussions on that? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor to recess? Okay, 4 0. Just to follow up what Gina said, I. D for the community members, the, the $200 is calculated on your 2019 enrollment. So that's where the 124,800 that Gina talked about, it's 200 times the 2019. Um, and then everything around that, it could be um, the PPE, it could be the plexiglass, it can be uh, partial salaries for the people that we've had to hire because it has to be for till December 31st. Um, it could be uh, legal work around the uh, memorandum of agreement with the unions because anything that basically you needed to do to get yourself up and running qualifies and then Kelly will put together uh, what I'll call the packet with all the backup and supporting material that I think um, people who sign the manifest will probably see just so that way there is that um, backup material. And then um, that check will just um, 
show up hopefully next week and be incorporated right into the budget i do think there is a potential that there may be another round of funding in f y twenty one it may not happen in may but tonight's vote in the public hearing would authorize us to take advantage of any of those funds that we may come across that are available to us so we have five years to expend that those funds um no um december 30th 2020 we have to expend them by then right but we, we have, have five years in which they could come back and ask us for evidence oh okay that's it so it's like an audit it. window yeah yep. so we have till now till december, december 30th yep december 30th of this but year so, um you know kelly's been doing a fantastic job ever since march splitting yeah. up fy20 and then um fy21 doing separate um accounts of anything covid related thinking that there might be some additional funding source or pulling it out because it wasn't something that we budgeted for essentially yeah. so she has all the spreadsheets ready to go with all the backup so I think we're in a really good place. I think really the trick is going to be ensuring that whatever is in those has a completion date of December 30th, and then she starts a new one for okay. December 31st. Not sure why the federal government forgot about December 31st, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So it can't be extended, is it, or it, it can be? This funding has to, is done on December 30th. Anything that we don't use, um, we lose. Got it. Um, but it, I'm sure there will be post-election additional <laughs> um, monies, you know, handed out to, and, and it might be in a mechanism like this. It might be um, as the um, original CARES Act funding where you had to apply for it and it was allocated based on, um, you know, our free and reduced population or, or whatever the case may be. It might look very different, but um, I, I would imagine that there might be more funding coming to the district. Got Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. Just yep. couldn't hear perfectly. Any right. other questions? Oh, I guess uh, we can open it up for any public, public input. Yep. Okay, we'll do that. Um, and, and what we can do is also kind of meld that. No, we can't meld it with the regular nope. public input. Nope. So this we'll has got to be specific. This and then we'll come. All right. Can you guys hear me through the mask? Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind yeah, of. Yeah. Pull, the, pull the mic down to your mouth, though. And then you don't have to tip. How down. about like that? Yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, I was curious, um, I'm hearing a lot of budgeting towards, you know, PPE, a lot of that sort of um, second level to supporting the kids. And then you also mentioned the um, grant for remote learning. And I, I, I'd be curious to hear um, how much of this money is uh, either being used for or maybe I don't know like is all of this money being used in reverse you've already spent it and so or is there some that you're purposefully thinking okay for professional development or di direct impact to you know addressing SEL and the and the remote curriculum and all of those kind of things that directly affect the kids do you want me to respond? yeah please sure so um, just to give you an idea the remote learning grant was specific to remote learning for special ed students, and it was $5,000. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we quickly went through that um, in terms of our eyes of where we would allocate the funding. Um, but luckily, teacher training and teacher professional development is all covered under Title II. So um, I've, those are funds that are already approved year to year, um, and that we, that I write, you know, I write them every July, and they extend over, um, for like a year and a half. So um, we've put in a lot of money for the work that our teachers did all summer long. We have an incredibly robust remote learning teacher website for, okay, you know, I had a ton of PD here, but I don't, I don't really remember, so let me go back. Our own teachers videoed how to do this, walking them through it step by step. We did a, some refreshers yesterday and during the professional development day. So although we can reallocate funds through because it's all for um, reasons of of covid um, we utilized other grant funds to kind of support our teachers in learning and you're right we do focus a lot on the ppe because that's sort of it's something that you can hold on to and you see and it's very easy to, to say that that is for coronavirus but you know the rest is what we always do our focus is just and um, Bob Thompson and I just sat down this afternoon and are looking to rewrite an additional 
funding opportunity grant specific to um, multi-tier system of support and supporting SEL within our schools in a more robust fashion, sort of pre-K to 12. So we're, we're doing all that work. I guess it doesn't get as much air time, um, which, which is unfortunate. We are spending you know, a ton of time training our remote teachers, but also training our in-person teachers for those practice remote days. Because what happens? We don't want a disparity. You know, I mean, I think every day is a, is a blessing to be in the buildings, but who knows when or if we'll have to go fully remote. And we want to make sure that we're all good to go and that we're um, sharing best practices. So we're definitely doing that. Any other questions relating to the public hearing? Okay, why don't we, can we come out? <laughs> nope, we just have to take a motion. Let's take a motion to uh, come out of the public hearing. Don't we have, do we not vote during the public oh. hearing on whether or not we're taking this? We'll take direction. No, it's, it's under deliberations. Thank you. Uh, so moved to come out of public hearing. Second. Okay, any uh, discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor to come out of public hearing? Four zero zero. Um, do we need a motion to resume and come back into order? No, because you're only recessed. So recess? Okay. So I, I tried to adjourn, but I was denied. <laughs> so. Shut down. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And that puts uh, us at the traditional public input. And, and we can, right, we can go ahead and open up the floor for public input on our agenda items for this evening. I'll go ahead and open that up. Seeing none. All right, we'll just continue moving on here. <laughs> it does right. seem extra quiet tonight. Yes, we're moving right along here. So um, we already discussed the principal's report, yep. so we're moving into our discussion phase around uh, COVID-19 updates. Correct. And the, the first two bullets, uh, the update and the calendar, kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing a trend in overall cases. Uh, we follow that very closely. Uh, we're monitoring that. Um, both Gina and I and Bob have meetings on Friday with remotely with our three different organizations where we'll, we'll get updates from uh, surrounding towns and districts, what's going on there, you know, all of those type of things. And we're monitoring it closely. Um, and at any point, we can pivot and go fully remote. Mm -hmm. We are trying to make sure we give as much advance notice to families as we can because they've asked for that. And, and in some instances, uh, they have to arrange daycare and those type of things. Uh, so it's not our intent to, to just jump into that, but it's very much our intent to keep breaking it down into smaller pieces. Uh, so, you know, to me, getting to election day was one of those days because it allowed us to take some time and look at the data, see where things were train, trending. Uh, next week, we have Veterans Day. We'll do the same thing on Veterans Day. And then uh, our next objective would be to get to the Friday, the I believe it's the 20th, which is the Friday before Thanksgiving week. Monday and Tuesday of that week are 100% uh, remote day and then a collaboration day for teachers. Wednesday is the traditional uh, trade-off for parent-teacher conferences, so we're not in session on that Wednesday. And then obviously Thanksgiving the day after. We uh, will continue to reach out to families regarding their travel plans. What I will share is that I'm starting to see people um, somewhat change their plans. You know, they're, they're, they're also seeing the trend and a number of people are now like, if they are going, maybe it's just to their, their sisters or their brothers and it's relatively local. And those same people have been gathering for months during the pandemic. Um, and the people who are doing extensive travel, like I said, have been great about contacting us and we're gonna work with each of those families. In terms of looking at the calendar, I just wanted mm -hmm. to kind of give you some information to put in, you know, to your head, uh, but no decisions really being made until the December meeting, but it also gets it out there publicly for parents, and we did this uh, last week at the Brookline meeting. So I'm looking, first of all, in January uh, at that Martin Luther King mm -hmm. holiday, uh, and probably either before it or after it, adding a remote day to give us some time, a whole weekend. And I, I'm, I'm leaning right now to the 19th because the 15th would be a Friday, it would be a half a day. And that would give me the half a day plus the, you know, a few extra days 
to really go through the buildings well it brings us back from our december break puts us into that fourteen fifteen day range so it also allows us we get into that two week period to see if we're going to have a spike we're already planning it time off if we see a spike we can always extend the remote learning but parents would already be home um, then looking at february um, I don't really have a problem going from Martin Luther King Day to February vacation. Um, I, I am considering a remote week after February vacation because March, like I said, is our traditional worst time for sickness. So it might just be a good thing. I'm not looking at the week before our vacation because that historically is Massachusetts vacation. And I don't think that you know serves us well commingling what could be two vacations. Um, so that the first week of march may be a remote week that's what we're discussing and then we're also talking a little bit uh, because march is annual meeting season so we're also thinking about more so the high school because we do plan to move the majority of our meetings to the high school to use that gym for spacing but we may want to put a day after an annual meeting uh, or before an annual meeting as a remote day but that doesn't mean that Hollis has to have the exact same schedule as the high school because the only thing in common would be the transportation and we're very fortunate the majority of our families are driving. Uh, then I look at the end of March again looking at some potential remote days whether it be a couple plus a weekend because otherwise I've got myself almost into 40 45 days between when we come back from February and when we leave for April. Now again we did see some positive trends last year it got a little better as the weather started getting warmer those type of things so we may not need it so what i'll probably do is come back and request january days and a february day and then we'll discuss again because i just think giving people a few months notice will allow them to plan but at the same time i don't want to make decisions unless we really know what the data is going to do and i'm not really worried because We've already tried to transition to remote for a day. It went very well. Our teachers are only getting better. The kids are doing it every day in the classrooms, whether they're here or at home. And there are many pieces of it that we'll, that we'll be looking to keep. Uh, you should also be aware that we're talking about remote snow days. Uh, and this is a balancing act for me because a, a snow day is, is like a precious, a precious occasion. You know, yeah. we all remember waking up and there was no school. <laughs> And it was like, wow, a bonus day, you know, for everybody. Waiting for the town to go by and you miss it by <laughs> one letter and you say. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're going to look at balancing that. And we're putting together right now that would share for informational purposes with the board um, what a remote snow day would look like. And what we would tend to do is automatically make it a late start, meaning that our staff would start with professional development or professional learning community time students would join uh, like a traditional delayed opening day you know 9 30 at the high school middle school 10 o'clock at the elementary level and then they would have a set schedule uh, online and it's part of me loves that snow day but part of me looks and says our calendar says we're getting out june 28th and i don't like that date either so i'd like to try to balance it so that we still have those you know if we get a big storm Maybe we'll just take a day and really relax. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it'll also depend on how we do for power because a remote day doesn't help us if nobody has power in the communities. So when we come back in December, we'll be able to share with you uh, schedules uh, to kind of look at and see what we're talking about. The principals have done an outstanding job with those. And that really gets us to the end of March. And that would be probably all I would talk about at the next meeting as far as days. <coughs> Um, and as far as you know what's going on in the buildings um, we continue to follow our protocols for masks uh, social distancing uh, eating um, we do intend to bring them outside as much as possible even though it's cold uh, we just might need more hats and gloves and mittens and things <laughs> but I think it'll be really good for the, the kids um, and our family's been great I, I think one thing that I'd like to to remind the board is that every day 
we come to school, we have kids with runny noses and headaches and temperatures, and our families have been fantastic about keeping that child home. You know, because that was a big worry when we started this, would people send their child to school sick? That's not happening. I mean, we do get some of the kids who naturally, when they're little kids, they go off, they're excited for school, they're here an hour, and all of a sudden, they're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And our nurses are just doing yeoman's work. And I think that was one of the strengths of the plan that Bob and Gina put together, was letting our nurses serve as our professionals around the medical pieces, because they have the great relationships with families, and, and they know our kids really well. So uh, that goes well. And again, I want to thank parents who have unfortunately had to quarantine for just you know, accepting that and doing that and, and making things go really, really well. So that's a little bit of our COVID update. And I'll uh, answer any questions either about the calendar or COVID that you may have. Andy, I've heard from a couple of community members kind of asking what is our benchmark or the event or numbers or whatever that would push us into full remote i know that that's fluid and it can be subject to say a governor's mandate mm -hmm. but is there kind of an earmark that would tell you that it's it's time to stop in person for the moment it, it to me it's really the positivity rate because to me that's a, a definite per 100,000 or based on the testing. But you also have to drill down into that because there was a day uh, just a few days ago where it went up to 2.4%. But for whatever reason, we only tested 3,900 people in the state. We had been testing 9,000 people. So if we had tested our normal number, we would have probably been about the same positivity rate. Not sure of that, but statistically that's what most likely would have happened. So I don't know why the number of tests went down. Uh, I do know that uh, you know they're very uh, readily available to get tested, mm -hmm. and the sites are getting really you know good. And you can sign up the night before and get over there. Um, and our families have been doing that as well, and, and sending those results to us so that we know we're not we don't have somebody with uh, COVID into entering to the building. Um, so. I would need to see the positivity rate kind of go up and stay up. Now it's, it's interesting sitting right next to, uh, in between Nashua and Manchester, um, I realize because of the nature of the cities, their cases are going to be higher. So there have to be something that says to me that it's also now impacting either our communities or our schools. And parents that are doing remote learning have been kind enough to let us know if their child has COVID. Because again, that helps us to know because uh, if I'm a remote learner, that doesn't mean I'm not socializing in my neighborhood. And two or three of those children and my next door neighbors or whatever could be coming to school in person. So that has also worked very well because those students who are the neighbors of the remote learner have quarantined. So families, have, I can't express it enough, how great families have been to help us make this doable, mm -hmm. you know? Good. I think it's also important, um, not just the positivity rate, but to take a look. So we've had seven total cases, SAU related, but it wasn't, we had a case, five days later we had another case in the same school. But, you know, there's been no evidence that it's been spread within the schools. So I think if you, your seven cases were in one school, right. that'd be a different conversation. Yeah. Um, right. but they're seemingly completely unrelated yeah. and um and and um you know knock on knock on wood <laughs> we haven't seen, um you know anything spread so i think that would look a little different i think when schools ought to close there's evidence of something different there's evidence of a spread or there's you know a, 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 an athletic team you know is all right is all together over the weekend and there's just too much information and then um, as a result we just need to close down and kind of take a, a break so, um, you know, the circumstances certainly, and, and that information is a conversation with us, but it's also a DHHS in terms of the, the of course. Right. Yeah. And, and I Thanks think, for discussing that. And I think the first call would be a two week closure because two weeks is the quarantine. Yeah. So it will kind of give us that time frame yeah. to see the, if it's going to be a spike or if it's a blip and we're going to go back down in, in our particular yeah. location and then during that two week quarantine, if we called that, that's when we're making the decision, are we staying out longer? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a number of districts that are gonna close 
from Thanksgiving to, to January. Um, I'm not saying we won't have to close at some point, but every day I can get in safely. You know, if I, if I ever thought it was a risk, uh, we'd close. I mean, we were one of the first districts to close a year ago, March 13th. Yeah. So we're not rolling dice to say we were in the longest. That's not what this is about. But if we believe our kids are safe and our staff is safe, um, every day we can get in, we'd like to get in. Good. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. On, on, on the flip side, um, have there been discussions around um, someday in the future <laughs> when there'll be um, indication that we will go return to fully um, in person? And is there, is there anything you can talk to us about that? I think we kind of touched on that in a previous meeting too to see if there was going to be a benchmark for it. So it we did. Did I miss that? I don't know. Maybe it was. It came up in yeah. discussion. Yeah. yeah. When we were talking about the the reopening plan over the summer. Yeah, I, I yeah. wouldn't say you. Not saying not to discuss it. Oh, yeah. okay. I was just commenting <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see how much it's changed if yeah. at all. Um, obviously, I'd like to get through this winter. Uh, if everything was to play out in a favorable way, if there was a vaccine that came out and people wanted to take it or people were willing to take it, that would start to work in our favor. I think one of the statistics that's out there is we're, we're still seeing a lot of cases, but the fatality rate has gone down. Um, so that is something that we may have to look at because this may be with us for multiple years. It may just not be as intensive as it is now but it may become something like the seasonal flu where you have either this or the seasonal flu. Um, but I would love to get everybody back and return to normal uh, as soon as we can. But at the same time, um, the way the children are responding and the way the teachers have delivered instruction, we'll stay with this model until we're very sure uh, that we can deliver everything safely. Excellent. Very good. I guess we can move to yep. diversity, equity, and inclusion yep. updates. Uh, with the chair's permission, it's sure. my pleasure Absolutely. to uh, introduce Tiffany Testa. I think a lot of you know Tiffany has come to meetings and spoken as a parent. Uh, Tiffany also works at, at the Parker Charter School. She has done extensive work and a lot of facilitating around this topic. Um, so she was kind enough when I asked to co-facilitate so that we could manage the time commitments and was willing to do that. And then she'll explain a little bit about our committee and what we've done so far. Uh, but you'll be seeing Tiffany or a number, another member of our committee coming periodically to kind of give you updates. So I'll turn it over to her with, um, thanks. Yeah. So um, thank you. And I'm speaking, I'm gonna just take this off. I'm speaking on behalf of the committee. There are seven members that Andy has um, spoken about in the past. And so um, what I did was I sent out an update to the group and the group gave feedback. So this is really representative of the whole group. Um, and we have met twice so far and our hope is to meet every two weeks, so twice a month. And our work so far has really been focused on um, building some bridges and trust and um, sharing stories and narratives of why we came to to this work and each individually and really seeing where you know we have some commonalities and where we have some differences um, and through that we've sort of recognized some of our most immediate needs this work is a little bit different than maybe some committee work that is done in the past around education where it's pretty linear and you've already go in with some really set goals. I don't think that that's what would characterize this committee's work. Um, but we have come to find out some of, of what we see as our aim. Um, some of our short-term goals that we have um, are to define terms. So. In the um, proposal of the resolution, not only to this board, but to the other boards and community feedback on that, what we really found was important is, is looking at and defining terms. So that's one of our short-term goals, namely the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, that's a starting point. 
we also want to edit and address the resolution that's a short term goal that we've started on and we will commit our next two meetings to looking at and then agreement on vision and purpose and goals of the of the committee so i have a few points i wanted to share regarding all of those short term goals first is that um, the committee it became very clear what we could and couldn't do as as the seven members that came um, we see ourselves as an advisory group and we're able to provide andy the superintendent with um, really diverse community perspective from surrounding the student experience and we also see clear limits as to what actions we can do in terms of beyond just framing the next step so what i mean to that is that our goals not we we have decided we, we don't know exactly what we'll be able to do but what we do know we are not going to do and can't do is that we can't um give a professional opinion or advice as to how to address diversity equity and inclusion because the truth is though some of us have extended you know extensive experience and expertise in education or in equity work or both as a collective whole that's not who we are we really are a representative group from the community so what we see that we can do um, is that we can serve as a thoughtful sounding board to the district and to propose a frame for the next steps in developing this the student experience with regards to DEI um, and ultimately those next steps would be voted on by the boards we also really see this committee and our aim is to gather um, community data in terms of community members students schools so we really we really feel as though we're a representative group and we also feel as though we can work to gather more input from the community one of the things that i wanted to address in particular is our work around the resolution because the resolution in particular to this board um, i believe the last at least the last time i was here there was talk about the resolution coming to this board and possibly voting on it, all of those things so i wanted to be really clear where we were at with the resolution again um, we see the resolution as really important to the foundational steps of this work so we hope it serves as a statement for the beginning work for this district to improve learning experience of every student in regards to dei but we also really need we, we also really see the need to build capacity and consensus so it's this idea to go slow to go to make progress and go go fast um, later on in the work and we are still at that consensus building place in in the committee and i believe it's representative of of in the group so what i can say is that we're focused on our kids and our community and building bridges we want the board and community to know that this committee is made up of a diverse group of opinions and perspectives some of this is word for word from the group so i, I want to get it right um, and we want we want the community and the board to know that in regards to the resolution that for those that spoke against the resolution in the beginning there are members on that committee that are further articulating their reasons and details why they were against the resolution and for those that were in support um, we want the community and board to know that there are people on the committee that are also in support and together we're really focused on finding some common ground and ultimately serving the kids with this idea that I kind of think about it as the work that you do with faculty too before you build before you can do that important work you have to build that buy-in it can't be you know given to you and so we want to give the board a resolution that reflects consensus um, at least within this group which is representative of very diverse opinions and experiences and perspectives of student experience so um, that is in regard to the resolution we but we do see the resolution as really important to the work 
so that resolution in our view is the board statement of support to this work it's not the goal it's really just the support of dipping our toes into this work and this work really is not about this committee the work is about the schools and the faculty and and the community members what our role can be is to really be thoughtful about where our community is in regards to this work and that will mean collecting data we also want the community and the board to know that this is fully intended our work is fully intended to include to be inclusive throughout the whole process of all of the voices in the community so we will purposefully give structure to getting feedback um, and let's see the last point that that we thought that the group thought was really important for the board to hear and Andy can speak more to this is that it's important that the community and boards recognize that already the positive impact of all of this from day one when the resolution came and then there was all that feedback and now there's this committee what it is doing and I'm, I'm happy to say this is that it's just opening the dialogue and conversation which is what this work is really about at all levels most importantly it is opening and modeling for our students this having this kind of dialogue and since because this has been publicly seen because it's been talked about since students are coming forward and sharing their narratives and their experiences um, and that to me is just like I've got chills right now just saying that and not only is it happening with with um, students but there's evidence that 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 members of the schools are starting to think about this and having conversations obviously in the community these conversations are happening so already we've only met twice um, the impact is there and it's those small little steps that I think are, are worth uh, celebrating um, because the change is really slow and the work is really hard but I also know that this group this committee believes the work is really important and that's pretty much an update I'm happy to try to answer questions on behalf of the committee or to point them to Andy if he might know better Questions. I just want to say thank you and thank you for your dedication mm -hmm. and that was a very articulate update I appreciate it do you plan to have a, um, a regular meeting schedule Yes, we're, what, what we aim to do is meet every other Thursday. So I don't know that, um, I don't know that we've said the second and fourth, you know, or anything like that, but that's what we've been doing and that's what we hope to do um, going forward. And the work is, um, the work is really, it's really deep, it's really thoughtful and it's, pretty slow we're getting through our agendas but we're purposefully we're purposefully structuring them and I think it's work not unlike but fairly different to some committee like task like a task force per mm -hmm. se which is very action oriented this this committee is not necessarily about action because that's going to be someone else's job right this is about building community consensus so that we when when we present to the board we already feel like we've got a community behind us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of like you know putting it in their face and go oh now what do you think about that whoa where did this come from mm -hmm. which is sort of what it felt like when the resolution came to the table mm -hmm. so um, in some sense just to uh, touch upon a couple things that Tiffany talked about uh, we presently have a 17 member group at the high school uh, who meets with Mr. Barnes have had um, one Zoom session and then one session out under the tent mm -hmm. uh, and they continue to, to move forward with their work. Uh, at our professional development day the other day um, we had a, a teacher in Brookline who has uh, a background in um, this work do a professional development presentation for faculty in any one of our schools. A number of people uh, attended and I received a number of emails 
saying we need more of this you know so we have people on staff and that's what i thought would happen gina has already reached out to some of her graduate school colleagues that she teaches with and gotten us recommended readings and different things that are out there so to tiffany's point there are so many things happening in different pieces and part of the goal of the committee is to kind of wrap all this up bring it together and put a nice package together you know that is here's where we are today but also this is where we want to be in five years you know we, we don't want as we've said at the committee level the one hit wonder this isn't about bringing somebody in and being done um, and <coughs> I will share that the 17 students that submitted information to the co-op board um, it's it's really surprising um, in a great school system some of the things that the students highlighted you know areas where we definitely need to improve but part of it's also understanding a piece of this is the developmental um, ability of say students from sixth grade to tenth grade uh, their brain is physically changing and not functioning totally and so when we as parents have those what were you thinking type of moments <laughs> trust me they're real and that's when some of these comments come out that's when some poor decision making yeah. is made so how the committee's talk is like recognizing that this is going to happen but how do you change it from a a once occurrence to something that is dialogue and talked about so that you know it isn't validated if it was inappropriate or it was addressed if it was needed to be addressed um, so there's really some powerful things going on and it's it's a fun committee um, it's and we don't always agree Th that's a definite we don't always agree but we're going to end up in a good place because we all have said time and time again that it's for kids T tiffany you mentioned um gathering community feedback that down the line um is that something that's already is there already an open channel for that in any way if people are watching and saying yes i care about dei i <laughs> have something yeah. i want to share um or is 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 that something that you know we should stay tuned for yeah. Um, yeah so one of the things that i i am sure our group will get into is is trying to bring out the narratives of all of the different perspectives of our students because that's really important in this work and we've done that by modeling that within our own group and that's been really 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 i love that kind of work hearing people's stories and their perspectives and so at some point our group will consider how do we hear all the stories not just the stories that are from from this group or but every one of our students is an individual and how do we hear their their stories and narratives and perspectives right now we don't have a way that that um, we formally can do that I do think that that's where our group will go I would say um, anyone that wants to share I, anyone that wants to share it send it to Andy and it'll get sent to the group mm -hmm. but um, you know I also know that there's ways to get contact info of, of the group members and already community members have reached out to us as individuals I think it's starting to be seen um, so no 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 formal way yet but and and that's what our group is going to do how we can thoughtfully do that how we can thoughtfully hear from and get the perspective of all families and all students you know there's there's lots of logistics around that and there's lots and lots of ways because in doing that we're going to build bridges and and common ground to move forward so i know that um it um, maybe it's different in terms of what the board was expecting regarding the resolution again like last time we met it was sort of like all right well in November we'll bring a resolution um, but um, I'm here to to hopefully give confidence to the process of it and and for those that want this to move forward quicker you know to to realize that it it would be valuable for us to move forward thoughtful versus quicker and for those that don't want it to move forward at all um, I think that those thoughts and opinions are also being looked at so that's that's 
pretty much it i can tell you it's a very diverse group and and voices are represented i'm wondering if there is a way to communicate to the larger population the community members and their contact information for people that do want feedback i don't know via the principles um you know the weekly newsletters but i'm sure there's a lot of community members that don't aren't even aware that this is going on and i just think it'd be helpful to have the you know the committee the the co-chairs or whatever you know the contact information um widely available i agree um any contact that's come in already like i've got it organized and i'm keeping it um but it does seem like a really good thing even if it's not you know just having that out there but i don't know if andy yeah, has I, like I love the the idea of a blurb maybe and then the principal's reports yeah. um yeah that would be that would be awesome so we could look at uh potentially establishing an email for the committee for this and then get that out through the yeah. principal's newsletter mm -hmm. um and then we could share it with the um the rotary's newsletter because right. they get a different audience than we do. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what I like about about all of that is I think that there are members on the committee that within our bit larger community will will be able to recognize a name or whatever yeah. and say, yeah, you know, instead of always having to send send it to Andy, yeah. it's just it's kind of like having uh, you know an advocate out there yeah. for the work. So. Okay. Any other Very questions? Good. Thank you for coming Thank out, you. Tiffany. Thank you. Right. Well, I guess we can move on to FY22 budget overview. Yes. I wanted to provide you an update because it's that time of year. <clears throat> and Kelly will be bringing, I think it's round two, to the uh, Hollis Budcom. And I think as the board knows, but just as for community members, Really, the budget committee is the one that works with the SAU to drive the budget. We keep the school board informed. The school board decides on the educational programming, all of those type of things. But from a strictly a dollar's point of view, uh, we work with the budget committee. Uh, we work with the formula that we refer to as guidance. Um, and that formula allows us to prioritize the needs. So. Uh, a very positive piece of this formula is that if we had unexpected uh, increases in special ed, that's considered outside guidance because the budget committee realizes we're mandated to those and they've never wanted those increases to maybe hurt or reduce regular ed. So they've always done a nice balancing act with that and that continues and this is Kelly and my, well, Kelly's probably 10th year doing budgets with them and my 7th. Um, and it, it really is a very effective process. Uh, so I'll just go through some headings and give you some ideas of where we're going. From a standpoint of personnel, uh, we believe we have appropriate class sizes to meet ed specs. Uh, so we're not requesting any staffing. We may need to move a teacher from fourth grade to fifth grade or something like that, but from the overall staffing, we, we don't see that as a, as a need. Uh, last year, you may recall that we did a directed uh, substitute for the SAU for a nurse, and we shared that across the SAU, and we didn't know COVID was coming, but we look really smart now. Uh, and that has been just a great way to get a quality individual who's part of our staff, and now instead of having uh, seven nurses, we have eight. And they can sub for each other, and they get to know the kids and the medicines and all of those things. So what we're looking at this year, the priority, uh, we originally put in, just so you know, a, a directed food service sub, a directed classroom sub, and a directed facility sub. One of the things we learned during COVID is we believe that we have the money in the substitute line to do a directed sub, just like we made a permanent sub in each building. If, if that works out as we believe it will, we'll probably continue to do that because that's having that steady individual assigned to the building is, is a great benefit for the kids. Mm -hmm. They get to see the face. What we're making a priority is a directed facility sub. Um, so for the, your two schools or your share of that across the SAU would be about $18,000, that's salary and benefits. And what that would do, and we're already doing it, 
is when we had a situation, whether it was COVID at the primary school or COVID at RMS or COVID at the middle school, we automatically just pull the custodians who are available and they go to that building. So this would just further expand that coverage model. So if we have a custodian out sick or, uh, or they lose a family member or something like that, we again have a known person that's on staff to cover. And pretty much with our size, every single day there's a coverage issue and if there isn't in a facilities type of thing we're always catching up on painting and things like that that they could be assigned to <coughs> so you'll see that will be the push for our facilities we are asking for an increase uh, in special ed for a position for the self-contained preschool program down at hps um, i will share with you that position is going to cost us about um, call it right around $70,000, but it runs about two to $300 an hour for services to come in. And if, this, and if you don't have the programming in-house, you're looking at probably your cheapest out of district placement of around $80,000 to up to your most expensive out of district placement of about $450,000 if you were going residential. So by building this structure in place, <coughs> it has really allowed us to maintain our kids in our district, which we feel we offer the best education, and plus they're on their bus with their peers in their, their neighborhood. In terms of the <coughs> excuse me, uh, replacement of computer equipment, we have our regular uh, rotation of teacher laptops, so we're constantly buying like 10, 10, 10 a year per building and then every seven years you're getting a new laptop. It's a very slow cycle, but it works well for education. Uh, we have right now request in for some Chromebooks. We're, they're in this budget, but we're also waiting to see because we're back ordered on Chromebooks like every other district across the country for uh, newer models that were coming in for COVID. Every student who needed a Chromebook has one. This was just, we had hoped to get ahead of the curve and we're in the midst of the curve with everybody else. Um, we also are looking to add a, uh, a piece of filtering software to further enhance safety for kids online. Uh, we have younger children online more than ever in the past. And again, as we know, sometimes they don't make the best choices. So this would allow a parent to have a greater comfort level, whether it was, if it was one of our devices that it's, that it's filtered. Uh, Paul is requesting some uh, playground equipment. We haven't done anything in a number of years down there. And then here, uh, we are presently, I think it's replacing two water bubblers with the water bottle fillers. And we have a, a proposal in to get rid of our bubblers and go to all of the water bottle fillers. We think that's much healthier and something that we learned. We always knew they weren't the healthiest environments, but now with COVID and the flu and everything, we think we can really cut down. Uh, so that is on target for candy school um, we have uh, approximately uh, preliminary guidance was set at about two percent our budget right now stands probably uh, a little over two and three quarters percent so we have some work to do but I think for this early in the budget uh, it goes well we definitely uh, working with the budget committee are trying to get budgets done as soon as possible because we don't know what annual meeting is going to look like. We also want to give the board the ability to decide if they want to uh, pare down the warrants and only do essential items. Um, next month we will talk about the SAU bond and that's on as one of the agenda items so you'll have a little more knowledge about that. So FY22 is going really well. Um, Carol represents us with Kelly at the, the, the budget committee meetings, and, and I would say they're following their recent positive trends. You know, I, I think it's a good discussion. Uh, I, I think our budget committee uh, realizes our reputation for schools, and they, they take that very seriously. And they're just asking us to re remember that COVID hasn't been kind to everyone. And I'll, any questions on that overview? Long way to go. Many more months. It's very early, early phase. Right? It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our bud next bud com meeting is next week. Next week, correct. Yep. Yeah. So they'll get round two, and kind of give them a good idea where we are. 
And please, there seems to be, looking at our packet here, there seems to be a substantial amount of money we're giving back to reduce taxes from our last fiscal year. So we want to make sure that's conveyed. And also, our lighting, what's going on with lighting. Is that something we can share at this point with BUDCOM? Yeah, I mean, we can probably get you an HSMART update. I'll ask Kelly to bring one to BUDCOM because the lighting is done. We are in the planning phase for the sprinkler system at HPS. The new heat units on this building that are almost 30 years old, all of those things are in process. I will share that it's just, it's a much slower process. Getting things delivered is taking a lot longer because of COVID. Sure. Yep. I know the lighting was something that we wanted to address in the first phase of HSTEP, and we didn't. And I know that has come up in several discussions with the budget committee. So if we can, if we have something we can share that we've completed and you're comfortable doing so, let's not hesitate and let them know where we're at. Yep. Kelly has, at our last meeting, Kelly did make mention of both of those items. She did? Okay. Yep. And I suspect now that, I mean, the lighting change was a big component to our savings calculation. So I'm sure that's going to stem another conversation after we have a few months under our belt running these lights, if there's any actual data and costs involved of running the lights and what kind of net benefit that is from a monetary perspective. Yeah. Kelly and I are keeping tabs on that and making sure that the BUDCOM stays updated for it. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Let's move on with the 2020 revenue and expense report. Sure. I'd like to thank Donna Smith and Kelly for their efforts on this. As you know, we're just trying to keep our attendance from an administrative point of view at a minimum, because if Donna or Kelly were to go down, that would cause an impact on payroll. And you would hear a lot about that. So we really want to limit that. As a result of the steps we took during COVID, which impacted us starting in last March, we were able to have savings in a number of categories, special ed, student support services, transportation, some not filling of positions, things like that. We had a large balance of professional development money that went unused because staff were not going anywhere. And what they were taking was online. It was very cost effective. So from an expense side, we came in $666,533.59 under what we budgeted. On the revenue side, we had $84,052.52 of revenue. So that gave us an unreserved fund balance of $750,586.11. And then every year through our warrant articles, we subtract the warrants that are approved by the voters for the unreserved fund balance. So we have the SAU building trust of $23,970, which is our rent that goes into the maintenance trust for repairs at the SAU. Then we had the Hollis maintenance trust for $120,000. We put $25,000 into the special ed trust account. And then working with the budget committee and the boards, we went to the maximum amount of money that we could retain because we didn't know what was going to transpire this year with expenses. We didn't know if we were going to get that $120,000 or things like that. So everybody working together, we retained $284,000. That dollar amount is looked at every year. So at the end of this year, we could decide to go back to our old amount. We could decide to leave it there. But it gave us great flexibility when we knew we were going to have to hire some more teachers, some more substitutes, those type of things. So that means that we're giving back to the taxpayers $297,616.11. When on the MS-27, we originally said that we were giving them back $100,000. So that will reduce their tax rate in some ways. 
and again i i do want to thank kelly in the business office for all their efforts of putting this together uh you know this was something that when kelly came in a, a you know a few years back with me she worked hard to create this document and i think it really has been well received by the community because we get this four times a year and everybody knows exactly where the money is being spent and what we're spending it on and i think that's uh appreciated so if everybody's okay with the expense and revenue report mm -hmm. or to, no questions i'll talk a little bit about the sa rent and long-term lease okay and i i've had a little bit of a conversation with rob on this uh trying to look at a strategy that we could potentially bring forward this bond uh next month i'll bring back the finished completed photo of the barn and how wonderful it looks and what it would give us in offices the barn if renovated would give us 4400 square feet of additional space the basement would be uh, all the storage we need for all the required records so it would be uh, totally appropriate temperature controlled environmentally safe for all the payroll business records um, retirement records that we're required to keep the first floor would be 1500 square foot of office and meeting space and the second floor would be 1400 um, square feet of basically office space and a, and a smaller meeting space in terms of our present sau um, it functions well but it's not designed to be a commercial building uh, the bathrooms are not in that format and we have in many cases two or three people sharing a 200 foot square foot space uh, along with the storage requirements this all started because we actually had a, a unacceptable weight load in the attic of all the years you know because we're, we're required to keep special ed records uh, payroll records you know 30 40 50 years graduation records and you may have noticed we added a nice little um, in, uh, house that is now a storage unit that is for our active records so we are hoping that uh, the board will support at least asking the voters for the bond uh, we put a lot of work into it last year and then through a technical glitch decided to pull it and we all respected that decision and thought it was the correct decision to make and then one of the pieces that had come up during many budcom meetings was uh, the space is utilized by three districts and yet we were asking one district to bear the brunt of the cost now that district does own the building and the property and if at any point the sau were to decide to leave it reverts back to the hollis school district they could sell it they could generate revenue off of that but i thought that the budcom made some very uh, strong points first of all around uh, the concept of a long-term lease before we entered into any type of arrangement they felt it would be appropriate for us to be in a lease and my thought process in talking with some of my colleagues many places that are renting facilities are in like 10 year leases so there's a a guarantee to the person that's renting in this case hollis that they will see revenue during that time and then when i look at uh, what we get right now we get 5868 square feet that's the present usable space in the farmhouse and we pay four dollars and eight cents per square foot which is well below market value so we believe right now that four dollars and eight cents per square foot does a pretty good job with all the maintenance needs we have we've updated our windows we've done those things so you know we need to do some work but some of this work would be done through the renovation because the bathrooms would be redone and uh, some minor hallways so you wouldn't be walking through someone's office to get to somebody else's office but when i look at the new additional 4400 square feet that's when i look at maybe that's where we can go to offset the bond uh, excuse me the bond because we we know we're generating enough revenue from a maintenance side right now to maintain it i'm getting a brand new facility if the voters approve it so i can't imagine there'll be a lot of maintenance costs right. especially in the first 10 years yep. so i just did some quick math at low ball numbers to kind of give people an idea if if we basically went from our four dollar rent now to um 
over the 10 year life, FY23, I would propose the rent goes up to $5 because that would cover the, the interest only portion of the bond. And then in 24, 25, and 26, I'm looking at increasing that to $7. And I'll be able to give you totals at the end of what this would mean. Uh, 27, 28, and 29, getting it up to $9. And then 30 to 32, it would be a $10 rent. To give you an idea, I believe the what was formerly the supermarket in town, the Whole Foods, uh, that was between 10 and $15 a square foot. All right. So I don't think we're out of um, price range with that. And if you do recall, we did do a little study on the Whole Foods, and it would have cost us almost 300, 750,000 just to bring that up to making it offices. Uh, last year's price on the bond, which we don't have an updated, we'll probably have it in December, was about 1.3, 1.4 million to do the entire bond. So over that 10 year lease at that, I'll still say very competitive and below market rates, you're looking at generating just about $400,000 that could go to the bond cost. I believe when you look at that, and again, it, that's open for discussion, but we're looking at a facility that would be able to, when it, after 10 years of the bond was paid off, the value if sold would recoup all the taxpayers' money for what they would have paid in the bond, approximately. And I think that's kind of um, the avenue that I'd like to discuss further with the board at, at coming meetings and kind of float at the budget committee because I think that starts to get us into a discussion point of what should the rent be. Now, I just went very low uh, because like that first year, yes, we're gonna be building, but we won't have any use of it. So we'll, we'll only still have the SAU as it currently exists. Mm -hmm. And then year two through year 10 is where we start generating some revenue strictly to offset the bond. Now, we would, there's also the potential, because if we raise the rental side, obviously we'd be raising that for the 5,868 square feet as well. So the board could make the conscious decision in years whatever to whatever, that excess revenue also goes towards the bond, or maybe it's split between maintenance trust and the bond. Um, but I just wanted to kind of throw that concept out and get your feedback for the concept, uh, and then I can put it more into what I'll call a formal Excel spreadsheet to, to look at it, and, and we can play around with it. And then uh, Carol can kind of discuss it a little bit with the budget committee, because I, I don't think, uh, and it's funny, as, as superintendent of the SAU, Brookline, and the co-op, um, I have a natural conflict of interest so we have two legal firms that will represent each side to balance it out. But at the same time, I can't imagine representing one of those other districts and saying that they'll pay for the majority of a building that they'll never get to have any use potentially after the 10 years. Now the lease may be re-upped and it might be the permanent home and maybe, maybe there's an appetite at the SAU board to increase that from 10 years to 15. Uh, all those are open. But I just welcome your feedback to see if we're kind of heading in the right direction or, or if you have a concept that's better than mine. <coughs> Let's do round table. That's okay. And you, uh, we can come back to you if, you're not, yeah, if you don't I, have I anything have. to say at this point. Yeah, come back to me again. All right, we'll come <laughs> back to you. Uh, Carol. I like this plan. I think we kind of touched on it a little bit uh, when we were planning to bring the bond forth originally this past spring. It just wasn't flushed out enough. So I think this has given us some nice time to get that detail settled. We talked with the SAU governing board about it kind mm -hmm. of preliminarily at our last meeting. So maybe uh, maybe that faux pas in the spring was actually a, mm. a good thing to have happen to give us this mm. time to really paint the full picture and to look a little closer at some of these. So I, I, I like this. I think this is a good plan to have that uh, rent increase over the period of time. And I'm interested to see what response will be when I do bring it forth to the other 
organizations. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, it seems to address the um, the concerns that the budget committee expressed, you know, several times, and I think also the community members as well. So I think this is a good yeah. plan to move forward with. So for me, um, there's, there's many ways to approach this, right? And I, I think last year we had extenuating circumstance. I'm not, I'm not philosophically, I'm not big on bringing back an initiative if we, if it didn't pass the last time. Right. But I think last year had extenuating circumstances. That being that it, the article itself was in defect, mm -hmm. I think that added complexity for the voters to say, yeah. well, what do I do? Right. Um, so I think that was a big piece. The other two big takeaways from what we heard from the debates and so forth is that there was a need to have a lease agreement to protect the investment on the property. Correct. And um, I did, didn't think at the time we were we had the ability to, to or, or the timeline to really get into those kind of conversations yeah. with the other districts. And um, and certainly, uh, so that, that was a big one. And the other one was they wanted a better plan or story behind how you're going to pay for it other than just have Hollis flip the bill for the bond. Right. So those were the big takeaways. And I think the way we structure the lease, we can address those two things. Of course, we'll, we'll, we'll do better diligence around making sure it's not, the article's not in defect. <laughs> But certainly the, um, the way we approach how we structure paying for the bond, I think, is still up in the air. But I think we're kind of coming towards going in a certain direction. And I think the lease is going to be key uh, because I think the lease is the vehicle that documents these, all these other aspects, right? Of, of you know, we, we had talked about a possibility of a lease um, uh, within the lease is the the rent itself being documented and maybe some sort of a uh, project assessment or bond assessment so we break it out separately what i'm hearing from andy tonight is that another way would be to combine everything the maintenance and the cost of the bond and build that into a, just a a square footage cost um so when i did those calculations i and i'm happy to share that at some point i have a big complicated spreadsheet mm -hmm. but um, as you are getting closer to 80 85 90 percent of the co covering the cost of the bond your square footage was approaching 13 plus a dollars a square foot that's beyond the typically 10 or 11 dollars that we were using mm -hmm. as a benchmark for commercial space so I'm happy, let's take another look at it. Um, that's fine. But, um, so that's one concern I have, is, is where does that square footage put us, right? Uh, the, other, the other aspect of the um, concern I have around the building it all in the square footage is because after the project's done, we really only need monies to maintain the property and I agree you put a nice new renovated barn there's not a lot of maintenance you're going to have to deal with so um, there's a concern that I have is that elevated square footage is now going to become a revenue generator for us we're going to generate a lot more money than maybe we would need to maintain it so the question is there's, I was, I've been thinking a lot about this. So the other thing is we could build in a policy that says that the trust where we keep this money is capped, right? And we can review the cap, right? And say, well, we, we, want, we know we need this amount of money to maintain it or to cover the bond or whatever it is, but we can always, I'm trying to find ways that we build assurances for our other stakeholders and the other districts because they're going to have these kind of questions, I, I suspect. So there may be ways that we build policy governance around the trust and say, hey, we're going to put some limits on how much we're going to ask. And once we hit that, maybe 
we relax the rent or whatever it is so i think there's a lot of different ways to go about it but it's it's got to be we've got to use that lease as a capturing method mechanism and there there's going to be a lot of work required to figure what the really the best way to go is and and march is coming but the the good news is is i think in general i my perspective is i think we did a good job at justifying why we wanted to do it we're only asking to use the space that we have we're not asking to bulldoze everything and put a beautiful shiny building we're just saying we have the space let us renovate and utilize that space and i think we also did a good job at explaining why we need it so i didn't get the feeling that people were pushing back or the community was pushing back from a perspective that it's not justified it's that they wanted more about protecting the the asset over time and and tell us more about how you're going to pay for it so that would be my input excellent so i'll try to bring something back in december i'll share um, some of this with Kelly and you can share some of it with the bug com just so they have an idea what would be coming yep. yeah whatever you send over would be great okay um, we often talk about the property of being able to break out the field the field versus that's, the buildings is yeah. that in progress that has to right be. now it has to be well, part of it well I, yes I agree with you that it has yeah. to be part of it I wasn't yeah. sure since we've talked about it so much if that was actually in process yeah I, I think the whether we decided to move forward with a bond or not, uh, we should have legal counsel separate and re get it redeeded. Um, because again, I also look at that property as potentially if you needed a, a a facility for a new school because enrollment just went through the roof, you have a great place to build. So is that we, that that's something we can just pull out? and make it and decouple it from this project right we can just say we're going to go forward in subdividing the property right we're, we've already reached yeah. out to um tom clausen and jim o'shaughnessy will be the two lawyers who know the district very well and they know the goals uh, tom is not uh as he said a real estate person but jim's firm is larger and has that uh those those individuals working there uh, but this way we won't have the conflict of interest and Tom knows the community so well he'll know what budget committee would expect what the school board would expect because he's done contract negotiations for both the town and the schools for forever okay um, I have a couple of questions about the timeline uh, so the in terms of the long-term lease that would that's something that's getting worked on now and and developed and then the stakeholders would the idea would that they would sign on to the lease before the bond is brought to the public yeah i think it would be the it, all that lease uh, would be all contingent on bond being passed otherwise right. so the lease would be contingent on the bond being passed i, I remember that being some of the, like the the legal stuff that was like kind of unknown uh, when well, we talked Within. about it being two different things. It was we want them to sign a lease and then we'll bring it up or a contingency. You know, I I don't know what the essay you would want to do if it isn't something that passes. If that's you know what the appetite would be if they if their need is greater than what we can provide without an enhanced building. There's not a lot of benefit for them to sign a long term lease. So I I would make it contingent. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to sign it, but I, that's the motivation of one of entering it in, right? We get it. Yeah. They're gonna, you know, they get the benefit of having their their administration in a building that can actually house them and right. actually be. It, it it it's relevant to their work, right? Well, I mean, we're we're it's getting cramped in that little, little farmhouse. Right. And, so. and and in terms of developing the numbers and that um, rate of increase um, over the 10 years, you know, that, that you, um, is that, will that work be done with the with the lawyers or, or, or is there a team of people that are going to come up with those numbers and then present a, 
proposal i'm just wondering because you know you said march is coming soon so it's like how do we get to that point where you get that figure the numbers that everyone's going to agree on and yeah well i think the piece that i would say on that is i will use numbers that we have kind of done a little research on based on commercial real estate and wanting to stay under those prices but i think i would only do that in the lease that every so many years it has to be reviewed because we don't know what's going to happen so we might say right. that let's just use five six and seven for the th first three years just to make it easy and at the end of the third year the hollis uh, school board will enter a discussion with the the co-op board with, uh, around the rate and solely around the rate so the, the and then you know years uh it stays at seven 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 for the next three and then it's another built in so everybody in the community knows when it's going to be discussed there's no secrets they know the the whole structure of the lease what the future yeah. cost will be and again i was talking about potentially getting close to nine or ten dollars in ten years okay commercial property is already at nine or ten dollars right. so, right. so yeah. I, I think one of the things we want to do is make sure that we the tenants want to stay and i think that's one of the goals that Bud, budget committee had uh, was that they didn't want to do this work and then the tenants want to move out because of whatever happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the other pieces is always going to be um, a Hollis school district. Uh, there's always going to be a high school in Hollis. So even if 20 years from now things separate or do different things, there's still a need for that building. I really see an opportunity for some policy around this, right? Because we can build a policy where it states that the board needs to review the rental situation of the property every X amount of years. And yeah. if they're going to raise a rate, they need to come forward and explain why. And maybe it's a, I, I don't know if it would be subject to a uh, public hearing or whatever yeah. it is, but to build some structure around it that says, the, the board could look at it and say, no, we're getting enough revenue from it to maintain it. We're good. No, no action this cycle. But maybe four years hence, I, I see that as maybe um, a way to accelerate how we structure the lease. Because mm -hmm. if we say we're going to build a, a, a policy that, that says we're going to revisit what that needs to be instead of projecting this all out yep. now and then that's a big job to try to figure out and right. like to your point there's no way to predict what right. the needs are going to be four years from now mm -hmm. so why don't we just agree that we're going the board shall review it and make a determination of what that is i would say that the board would not seek approval from anybody they're just going to review it and say this is what we need to do and as you know but uh, that that's a whole other conversation yep. <laughs> yep so we the policy committee actually drafted a sample policy around the um, rent and reviewing the rent um, periodically but we just felt like we had a bigger conversation to have first before yeah. bringing that forward. well it's so. kind of coming around now right. and yep. it's, it's getting right. timely again um, I think as much structure we can build around this the better it's gonna cause people to maybe feel comfortable to support it mm -hmm. Um, that we kind of thought in these terms and and certainly you know we, we want to make it such that even the other districts can support it and see the value of doing this work and kind of make sure they see that we're making an effort to try to find a, a very well workable process that doesn't um, you know make, give them concerns right because they have budgets and have things to worry about as well so so is this is this like a governing board like would the governing board be voting on this to approve the lease because i just feel like i know you said that you have a conflict of interest i feel like almost all of us have a conflict of interest how do we vote do we not vote on it no it, it it'll all be the conflicts will be removed because of having the two different attorneys to in it but it would definitely be the governing board would have to agree to lease the property okay. from Hollis. Right. And Hollis would have to be willing to be the, the owner and uh, proprietor of the property. Okay. Yeah. So we also are paying part of the lease as right. Hollis. We're right. payees. So when you, yeah, we're payees. We charge we're ourselves. Both sides. Right, right, right. Yep. So, so um, I think that that kind of helps remove the. What kind of 
approvals around a lease agreement do you see from a standpoint of needing to bring this to a to an annual meeting or can the are the boards in power to be able to enter into these things as a matter of running the business the legislative body for the SAU board is the SAU board the Hollis board has been renting the property for as long as I I've been here so there's no nothing new that the voters would have to approve in Hollis because you're doing it it's just more you're locking into a more formal time frame rents how the rents going to be used that type of thing so it's more the SAU board saying that they're going to reach out and rent it but they each board has that right to do that without voter approval because we're not purchasing any property now would the chair of the governing board be the sign 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 e if you would or of the lease or maybe we're getting too technical to the vote would be the signing all the vote would do is authorize the chair to sign based on the SAU board's vote okay so when is the when is the SAU next governing board December 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 okay so that would be the timeline of approval I guess we're still working and would there be opportunity if there could not if there couldn't come to terms at that or would that already be worked out ahead of time then it would just be the formality of the meeting well it wouldn't be a formality because for many people the SAU board doesn't meet so they would be seeing it so it would probably be one of our you'd have the SAU budget would have to have its public hearing and then probably this lease and that would probably be about the only two things you could really get done because I think this would be an extensive discussion I would even say that we could decouple some of this because I think we're already running time is already running short with all its moving pieces we could say we could seek bond approval and again make it contingent upon a lease getting signed if at least doesn't get signed we won't pursue the bond or we can have all these things that say we're working on it we're we're gonna get the lease or we're not doing it right so there's probably ways we can structure this at least from a standpoint of getting it at a point where people can get behind it vote for it or vote against it and and kind of decouple some of this the mechanical pieces behind it I don't know it would be there's nothing even if nothing happened with the barn we really should have a long-term lease between the SAU and the Hollis board for the building just as it's just a good practice good practice there's no real agreement of how things are going to be run or treated you know so I think that's a good practice and then in that lease you could put additional square footage is paid at the regular rent so there's a lot of ways that the attorneys can can look at this and I think I would ask them to be there that night because I'm sure that they'll do a much better job answering those type of questions that we can so is a sense of the board that we would like this pursued yeah okay the last bullet there we've already talked about it that's just a check coming in so we can skip that and go right to deliberations and the first deliberation is just the item for what we had the public hearing on we're just looking for the board's formal vote authorizing us to accept funds okay to see what action the board will take regarding the receipt and expenditure of fiscal year 2021 unanticipated fund revenue associated with the CARES Act and any other local state or federal resources as set forth by RSA 198 colon 20 B dash B that is I motion to approve the acceptance and expenditure of fiscal year 2021 unanticipated revenue to any this is just what you write associated with the coronavirus aid relief and economic security CARES Act and any other local state or federal resources set forth in RSA 198 colon 20 dash B the board to be provided with a full accounting of the revenue amount and expenditures second discussion I think we had a plenty of discussion before so I certainly don't therefore all in favor four zero zero to see what action the board will take regarding the policy memo submitted by the policy committee okay so our policy committee got 
um had a couple of organizational meetings but really haven't we haven't done a lot of work since a year ago so we have for third reading a couple of policies that we last saw oh a while ago december 2019 so we have eea student transportation services no changes have been made um, we're hoping for third reading and adoption all right i'll take a motion uh, so motion to accept the third reading and adopt policy eea student transportation services second discussion seeing none all in favor four zero zero um, great also for third reading jfaa admission of resident students um, and so we saw this last um, also December 4th, 2019 as amended. No, so these changes were actually the changes that were brought forward uh, last December, so. Uh, motion to amend by replacing his slash her with their and by correcting the reference to the new returning student registration section of the SAU 41 website accept the third reading and adopt policy JFAA admission of resident students as amended second discussion um, not sure I, I, I there's something that didn't the wording didn't make quite sense oh. to me <laughs> um, uh, but the the sentence below new resident students it says all new should register at and I believe it, you, it's students. meant to say all new students families. should register families actually or families families yep either way I'm fine with but that would be uh, an additional yes. amendment I would give yep. and beyond that I'm I'm fine with supporting this anybody else Seeing none, all in favor with the amendments? Four zero zero. Okay, so for the next six policies, these are lengthy as we discussed, um, but I remind us that we are looking at these for first reading, so we're hoping to bring it back for second and third for further discussion. Um, uh, so with that, I take a look at um, uh, J-I-C-K, JIC, the, this has been updated with changes in the law. Uh, everything is, is underlined. Um, essentially, some timelines have been adjusted. Um, and hello. Uh, <laughs> Those are our um, new lights. <laughs> and then the discussion of, you know, electronic copies. A lot of times information is shared with us electronically. Um, and as I mentioned, just a lot of updates to the law, so therefore the policy needed um, to be updated and the appeals process was also updated so um, you know kind of first read puts it on the table and puts it out to the public um, to identify that we're discussing this but my hope is that um, detailed feedback can be provided to the policy committee so we can work can on it. we enter these into first reading uh, on a bulk um, motion or do we have to do these separately i think we can do it on a bulk motion okay, okay. What, what is the what does dawn say in our she has each our, one uh, listed separately she has them listed separately mm -hmm. i i'm always a little cautious about <laughs> doing something other than, Different what, than what dawn she recommends said, so i know she's really good about that so why what is she, the point of doing them in bulk uh time time are we reading so. them out loud by in, in their entirety no no we're just entering okay. we're just putting them on the table we're not even saying we're going to de delve into them tonight we're just saying we're going to open them up for first reading right uh, mm -hmm. and and more work is coming yeah <laughs> so i am I'm, I'm fine with it but um so there's a couple of them um i'm just noticing like the first reading that's in here the date is incorrect so I don't know if we do want to enter them in separately just to at least get that correction on the table. I don't know. Well, we're going to we're certainly going to correct and, and do all kinds of things to the verbiage. Um, I'm just kind of going through my mind is would there be any benefit of doing it tonight versus when we really get into mm -hmm. the the uh, the changes to it 
you know i'm i'm happy to go individually i do want to explain so on monday when the amendment was was shared i was not in the office that day i came in to send the policies to jackie so they could be posted and sent out i sent out the sample for daf not the one that is specific to hollis the only difference is that this is a sample so it talks about um adoption notes and such and there are blanks where i would insert superintendent etc um so the the policy essentially is unchanged for daf um but if you want to go through individually then i can just speak to that when we're discussing daf and just you know go through the others quickly if we're allowed to do it in bulk i i don't I don't have a problem with it, but if it's if it's outlined that we're supposed to do it singularly, I don't want to mess anything up. I feel like yeah, we spent, th more, we spent more time talking about whether or not we should have just said <laughs> it let's individually. Just, let's just stick with the <laughs> outline, shall we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, let's. It's like a child spending a ton of time arguing bedtime. <laughs> okay, so I motion to accept the first, reason, uh, first reading of policy J-I-C-K, uh, Pupil Safety and Violence Prevention Bullying as presented. Second. Discussion. Seeing none. Uh, oh. Oh. So th it's been a long time since we've done policy. So it, it's preferred that we just have opened it. But I just saw. I like when I read through it. I saw something that there was an inconsistency. But do we, oh, should we be saving that for a, a future meeting? Um, if right you now. could send it to the policy committee. That if you could send it to the policy. Just committee, send it to the policy committee. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you see something, just let them know. Just let them know yeah. rather than discussing it here. Yeah. I, I just it's been too many months and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm technically still new to the board. Okay. Great. Usually, Thank when you. we get deeper into the readings, we we spend a little <laughs> yeah, bit yeah. more time looking at it and really <laughs> talking about it. So, the, for now, it's just really it's we're COVID just getting it on the table. It's COVID we're getting fog. It started. I'll call it yeah. that. <laughs> so our next meeting, um, we meet uh, the first or second Monday of the month. First. Is it the first? First. The policy committee does. November. Oh, I, I thought you meant. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I thought you meant it, the, yeah. November 16th is our next meeting. So if you <laughs> share anything with us prior to yeah. November 16th, okay. we'll discuss it and then present it for our December meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. We discussed that for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, we were we went down that road. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay. Motion to accept the first reading of policy GD funding proposals and applications as presented. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Did we Board vote on JIC? No. Oh, <laughs> man, we're stacking motions here. Um, all okay, right. all in favor of the motion for JICK. 400. <laughs> Uh, okay, motion to accept the first reading of policy ECAD security camera system. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Again, 400. Zero, zero. Uh, motion to accept the first reading of policy ECAD R security camera system administration administrative procedure. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Ah, question. I yep. feel like we're going to Actually, too <laughs> I do have discussion. Okay. On ECADR, yep. at the bottom of it, it has a first reading date of January 8th, 2019. Is that what you were talking about? Right. That's what I was saying. We'll change those <laughs> to today. Okay. To change those to today. Okay. These were it, prepped for a while ago. And yeah. We just prepped. wanted to make sure. Yep. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Thank you. Right. And these are new procedures. I'll say these two, ECAD and ECAD slash R, are new procedures. Um, for this district because of now we do because of the installation of security cameras um, but these are um, policies that are in place at the co-op perfect thank you okay uh, motion wait did we vote on that one yes yeah. okay yep uh, motion to accept the first reading. Of oh wait, wait. Did we no, vote we, on it? You no, had, no, I halted the. Right. Vote. You halted it because you had a question, which yep. is fine. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Four zero zero. Uh, motion to accept the first reading of policy EFD wellness. Second. Discussion. So I'll just add that um, we accepted this policy and replaced a former one a couple years ago. We have since received annual feedback from the DOE, and we have now been put on notice that we need to accept these updates that include um, um, goal setting, 
in order to continue to receive to be part of the school lunch program and in a year where all students are receiving free lunch it's a year that we want to make sure we're part of the school lunch program sure so is there a deadline for that acceptance for the acceptance of you just said we have to accept these additions oh um well we were asked to a couple years ago and last year and well, and we had to adopt it in the co-op as well. The co-op was not necessarily for the policy. So it was, it, it's an SAU-wide um, ask, but because there was a lot of resistance at the co-op, we didn't necessarily act on it. Okay. No, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if there's a deadline on accepting it so we can continue to receive the free oh, lunch stuff. I think if, if it's moving along it's in through process. readings, we'll be fine. Perfect. Thanks yeah. for clarifying. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Four zero zero. Motion to accept the first reading of policy DAF administration of federal grant funds. And these are those notes you're referring to. Thank you. I'll need a second. Second, sorry. Discussion. So as I mentioned, um, I apologize. I did send um, the wrong copy. It was I just clicked DAF and sent it to Jackie. So I will send out the the one that is specific to Hollis. Um, tomorrow and have it reposted but essentially the contents are here and I'm sure you've memorized all 20 pages on the policy <laughs> but basically this needs to be in place for us to receive our regular typical grants that we always receive like title 2 title 4 um, um, and then IDEA so hundreds of thousands of dollars that uh, if we were to get audited we need to have this in place and it identifies procedures we already have in place we're just formally saying that they're that mm -hmm. these are our procedures any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you. I'll take a motion to go into non-public. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, motion. We need to do it by. <laughs> so we are going into non-public under RSA ninety one A uh, colon uh, three Roman numeral two um, for compensation and or C reputation. Um, so we'll do that by um, roll call. Amy, I. With, oh, sorry. Okay, Amy. <laughs> Amy, I. Carol, I. Breath, I. Rob, I. Mm -hmm. Okay.